one time there was very little going on within the region other than some minor logging and, and fisheries. That was essentially it. But as of late, in the last couple of decades, we've seen a lot of interest from other entities within the world to access our place to get uses out of it. You have the oil and gas industry, you have the renewable energy industry, there's a, a range of uh, recreational structures that are building up here from cruise ships to, to major sport fishing and recreational fishing opportunities. So that is coming our way if it isn't already here and the, the pressures are, are becoming quite substantial in terms of the marine environment. There are a lot of pressures out there, there's a, a lot of need for access. How do you best develop that? Uh, coming from a governance role, uh, we have a tendency to plan things very rigorously. Uh, we're both uh, obligated and, and legislated, to be perfectly honest, to provide responsible planning on behalf of our constituents. So this sort of fits in with the overall. We've done a very comprehensive land management plan here in the North Coast for a number of years. That was, uh, that was instituted. We have the Central Coast plan as well. We've done a range of things around the terrestrial. And now it's time to take a look at the marine and say, all right, just how do we want to use this environment and what would be the best and most responsible uses of this environment? The idea of integrated uh, planning really comes from um, the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea, which was uh, ratified in 1994. And one of the major bases for that was to ensure that coastal communities are connected to the resources that are on their doorsteps and that independent fishermen have access to those resources and that they're not just taken from uh, the oceans by foreign countries coming in and uh, fishing our, our coast. And the Canadian government's you know, response was our Oceans Act. Uh, that set out uh, and, and tasked the Department of Fisheries and Oceans to take that leadership role and develop integrated plans for, for sustainable development on our coast uh, to protect the, the ecosystem. So they have a, a mandate to lead that um, and they really need to step up and, and take that leadership uh, because of the importance of the oceans to our country and to the people on this planet and to all the other species on this planet as well. My name is Art Starrett and I'm the Executive Director for the Coastal First Nations. Our territories extend from our, uh, the mainland around the top end of Vancouver Island all the way to the BC-Alaska border. So it's about two-thirds of the coast of BC and we're an organization that plans for the future. That's, that's really what it's all about. That everything that we do has to be based on a plan. And so we began together, working together, on a plan to build, to, to breathe life into the rights and the title that we have in this region. Uh, we do that by land use planning. We do that by marine use planning. And so we began with a massive uh, uh, land use plan that became known as the Great Bear Rainforest. In the mid-1990s, an epic battle over the clear-cutting of ancient rainforests, a battle which came to be known as the War in the Woods, raged along the BC coast. Lasting a decade, this conflict was finally resolved when the opposing parties arrived at a joint vision that created the land use plan for the Great Bear and protected 50% of the Great Bear rainforest. The strategy to resolve conflicts over natural resources by collaborative planning is now being put into action in the waters of the Great Bear Sea where our demands on the ocean are stressing both the marine environment and local communities to the limit. And so planning, whether it's terrestrial or marine, is no different. Looking now, it seems like it was obvious we should have done this a long time ago. Forest companies started to realize uh, pretty early on, particularly with the Great Bear Rainforest, that you couldn't just fight it. It had to be a joint exercise. A lot of the things that I do uh, outside of the planning is, is restoration. And we, I learned quite early on that talking with First Nations and particularly the elders um, on what was there before it was incredibly valuable information and it steered a lot of my decision making. The relationships with First Nations now that we have in the Great Bear Rainforest uh, are by and large quite good. We have taken that blueprint for success on the terrestrial side and moved that over into the marine side. 
And that's where we always want industry to be with us. Whether it's the BC Seafood Alliance, which represents the majority of commercial licenses in the province, or uh, you know some small sector, we want them all in the room. We want everybody in the room. Uh, we're pretty pragmatic. We 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 recognize that people have needs. Uh, they have privileges they've been granted by various governments, and we recognize those as well. But they also have to recognize that we have rights that we're not going to allow to be undercut. I remember the first battles for the Great Bear Rainforest back in the 90s, and I was still in high school then, and I remember going to uh, some of the, the meetings that they had. You know, a lot of the forest companies, you know, had a schedule to come and log the Great Bear Rainforest. It wasn't known as the Great Bear Rainforest back then. But at the time, you know, my community basically said that, you know, we have plans for our land and for our water, and uh, when we talked about protection, uh, we talked about protection for both, and we didn't really see land and water as, as, as two separate things. Um, uh, but unfortunately, the way uh, the provincial and federal governments work, that's the you know, uh, land is provincial and, and feds is, is water. So uh, we had to separate the two in order to uh, come forward with uh, some solid protection. So I think we started working on the land use planning first. And, um, you know, uh, back then we looked at about 50% protection for the, uh, the territory, which is huge uh, for the area, but uh, wanted to protect, uh, you know, the values that the, the uh, Kittisu Hayes people had in those areas. So we picked some uh, very key areas and uh, looked at protecting uh, you know, all the species within those areas, uh, including the forest. So now we have about 47.5% of the uh, Kitty Suez territory locked up in a protected area. Now we're able to sit down uh, with forest companies and determine where forestry is going to happen and making sure that those forest companies aren't impacting food areas, cultural areas, ecological areas. Um, so that's been uh, very important. And uh, I think now we want to kind of translate that sort of management onto the marine side by developing these marine spatial zones like we have on the land side, that will help us protect multiple species and make sure that you know, those species continue to be there, and not just for First Nations, but for everyone. We've got to strike this balance, and it's very difficult. You know, we have to be profit-oriented, but at the same time, we have to consider our environment. And the value of that environment is part of our balance sheet. We look at that environment as a way to sustain us now and into the future. It's not like we are, are saying no to business, but what we're saying is no to destructive development. Uh, that's going to destroy our ecosystems and our environment. We're doing business in a different way so that when you want to come into our territory, you know that there's going to be a viable opportunity here long term. And that if, if industry, uh, whether they're independent or larger corporations, uh, work with us, uh, we know that we can guarantee a long term access to whatever resources in our territory. Uh, but we have to protect what's left. It's very important. The ecosystem has to support itself first before it can support anyone from the outside. So the conservation needs to maintain the species that are here, to maintain the people that are living in the, in the you know, whether it's a First Nation or a non-First Nation community. Um, and then if, 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 if there's surplus that can support people from the outside, then by all means, I mean, then, then there's those opportunities. So this has allowed people to take stock, I think, in, in marine planning in terms of all the resources. So all that detailed work was done uh, at looking at every resource, um, what's, what needed to be protected for conservation, which areas, how, what system of protection was necessary, which areas were, were important culturally for people to access for food. And then, and then you look, okay, what's the fat that's left over in terms of the opportunity once you've looked after the ecosystem and, and cultural needs. And then, of course, you identify certain areas as well that can support certain types of industry, whether it is shellfish farming, whether it is finfish farming, whether it's a, a, a marine hydro project, you know, with a, with a turbine and a tidal turbine. Uh, wind power is being looked after in terms of energy needs because that's often a marine industry because they build the towers, in, you know, in marine sites. Um, so all of these things are, are being kind of looked at into the, uh, into the future.